So I was cruising about the South Sahara the other day and was accosted, as I often am during such excursions, by the mighty lion, who was smugly curious about what I, a fragile human being, brought to the Darwinistic free-for-all that is the struggle for existence. You have not, said the lion, a luxuriant mane, nor an intimidating girth, nor an arsenal of razor-sharp claws. That you sit haughtily atop the animal hierarchy is surely nature's great punchline. I thought for a moment, then replied, I, sir, have the underlying cognitive capacity to construct complex narratives about my moment-to-moment -moment experiences weaving past, present, and future together in an elegant tapestry of human events stretching all the way back to paintings on cave walls lit by flickering firelight. This storytelling instinct is one of several outer garments of a consciousness that capacitates problem solving which precipitates the creation of tools which so forges the first link in the great chain of perpetual innovation which hoists such wonders as the plow, the war chariot, the exploratory vessel, the internal combustion engine, and after what seemed like eons of anticipation, social media. The mighty lion then sheathed his mighty claws, and we spent a lovely afternoon discussing the pros and cons of the Panthera Leo social structure. The moral of this no doubt riveting tale is that storytelling occupies a place very near center stage when it comes to activities that give meaning to our existence. And though the grand human narrative as told by social media frequently assaults our senses with the dull drone of monotony or the stale stench of the pissing contest, it can hardly be denied that storytelling, such as it often is, is the lynch pen of this great 21st century paradigm shift. Facebook, Twitter, and the like did not turn us into ravenous storytellers so much as they revealed the Aesop that was inside us all along. With the ubiquitousness of narrative in mind, let us now turn to one of the soundscape's most instantly recognizable story songs, Harry Chapin's Cats in the Cradle. The song extends to us something very much like an invitation to turn the pages of the family photo album. As we listen to its first person narrator slash protagonist poignantly recount his failings as a father, we find vacant sleeves of plastic where photos of father-son memory should be, and we listen helplessly as themes of alienation, absence, and missed opportunity tear into the hull of that most titanic of responsibilities, parenthood. Concise as it is transparent, the narrator spins his tale with the yarn of the vernacular, making few to no attempts at poetry. We find none of the rich ambiguity we've seen in previous readings, but we also get to forego the time-consuming labor of unpacking packing the overstuffed luggage of literary obfuscation. The song makes up for, in heart, what it lacks in subtlety, however. And where practice is clear and apparent, theory can abound. But instead of stuffing a critical perspective into the corset of a thesis and ushering it hurriedly into the party for the proper introductions, the text, much like in a close reading, will guide and ground our insights as we brush away the dust of the particulars in pursuit of the universal. And so Cats in the Cradle will, to the extent that a single text can, help us lay bare the basic anatomy of narrative and provide us with a context for answering the following questions. What elements are required to turn a simple string of events into something we would recognize as a story? Why do we tell such stories? And why do we feel the need to reenact, through narrative, unpleasant, tragic, or horrifying events? Let's see what the first verse can teach us. My child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way. But there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away And he was talking for I knew it And as he grew He said I'm gonna be like you Dad, you know I'm gonna be like you Our tale begins at a most natural entry point, the birth announcement. And perhaps not the most natural, but certainly most necessary introduction for us is with the terms plot and discourse. The plot or events of the story are easy enough to grasp. Dude becomes father and misses his son's first steps due to the pressing demands of what we can assume is his career. But the son, like most sons, idolizes his father nonetheless, and we are sure daddy will do better next time. But bearing down on the how requires us to move at a pace much slower than the reader only only interested in the what. A reader more attuned to the subtleties of discourse would make much of the planes in the bills, already noticing tension between the father's pride in his son and vice versa, and the frantic pull and pace of the working world. Better still, our careful reader, as we will refer to him from here on in, knows to be on the lookout for how these themes will develop over the course of the narrative. The casual reader is itching to move on to the next plot point while the careful reader attempts to draw his attention to how the discourse of the narrative 
narrative is manipulating the flow of time, starting with the child's birth, and then, as if catching a plane through time, arriving many months later at the point when the child learns to walk. Hardly one more line in, we are teleported to the point at which the child can not only talk, but is far enough along in his cognitive development to form coherent sentences, anticipate future events, and draw comparisons. And so our careful reader adds another item to his things to watch for cue. With our careful reader now at gunpoint, he calmly over the casual reader's jittery insistence that he PRESS THE BLOTTY PLAY BUTTON insists that the concepts of the filter and narrative gaps are essential to our understanding of narrative as a psychosocial phenomenon. Noticing the casual listener's hands growing sweatier, we will assuage his mounting rage by illustrating how these concepts work with an alternate version of the first verse. My child arrived just the other day A snotty nose brat, what do you want me to say? My cool job at Google, my bills do pay He learned to walk, so I guess hooray And he was talking for I knew it And as he grew, he said I'm gonna be like you, dad And I said, how nice grew you With the casual listener's pistol lowered for the moment, we have here a hypothetical verse that has much the same plot. Dad's priorities are still questionable, to put it generously, and the son's still left clutching the sharp end of the broadsword. But the discourse is altogether different because the events are run through a different psychological filter. Because the father in our hypothetical verse is a more overtly terrible person, or perhaps just a more honest or self-aware version of the real narrator, his story sounds very different, though the events are much the same. He also also fills in gaps with details that are just unimportant to the real narrator because we can clearly see that he intends, even at the start, to convey a story about absent-minded and well-intentioned abandonment. Thus, the real narrator doesn't invite us to strut with him down Silicon Valley or wherever his checks are written, because it's not relevant to the story he's trying to tell. The careful reader's things to watch for list forms early in the reading process because he's figured out the kind of filter our narrator is employing. What the narrator needs to say in order to serve his chosen themes and the details he can leave unsaid because they simply have nothing to do with his purpose. Sensing our casual reader's palpable temptation to turn the pistol on himself, let's take a look at the chorus, verse, and then chorus again. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon Little boy blue and the man in the moon When you're coming home, dad, I don't know when We'll get together then You know we'll have a good time then My son turned ten just the other day He said, thanks for the ball, Dad, come on, let's play Can you teach me to throw? I said, not today Got a lot to do, he said, that's okay And he walked away, but his smile never dimmed he said, I'm gonna be like him, yeah, you know I'm gonna be like him. And the cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon, little boy blue and the man in the moon. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when, but we'll get together then. You know we'll have a good time then. The casual reader will immediately notice the references to such childhood delights as the cat's cradle game and the silver spoon christening gift, one which, by the way, must be awfully disappointing to the baby, as well as allusions to the little boy blue and man in the moon nursery rhymes. The theme of absence echoes in the chorus with son asking after dad and the well-meaning father assuring him of good times to come. Okay, ready for verse two? Not quite. The careful reader and examiner of narrative discourse will ask how the references to childhood function within the text, arriving quickly at the conclusion that they encapsulate those special moments the father has missed while playing king of the corporate ladder, with the depressingly brief father-son exchange constituting, for all we know, the father's entire catalog of precious memories. But it's also worth looking at these references more symbolically. The silver spoon and nursery rhymes are tied closely to the idea of ritual. Silver spoons are given out of time-honored tradition, and nursery rhymes are often read and or quoted as a bedtime routine. Likewise, Cat's Cradle, like all games, is returned to again and again as a means to pass the time. 
Taken together, the time symbolism is clear, and these references start to sound less like fragments of a cliched childhood and more like an incantation meant to accelerate the hands on the clock. It's no surprise, then, that after every chorus, we arrive to find both father and son noticeably older. Okay, so we're done with the chorus for now. So Dad realizes that life is short, quits his job, and redirects all of his newfound free time to playing an everlasting game of ping pong with his son. The end. Oh, Hallmark movies, how you've spoiled us so. No, the chorus instead transports us to the son's 10-year birthday celebration, where we're stunned to find that despite having a job that covers outrageous airfare prices, the best gift Dad could muster was a ball. I mean, doesn't he know that you can only fill the hole left by the lack of a fatherly role model with the latest piece of virtual reality? hardware. Geez, the stones on that guy. Still, we get a nice piece of characterization in which the son makes the most of his surely you can do better than this gift and gently acquiesces his childhood to the mounting pile of papers on his father's desk. But with dad's continued mismanagement of the complexities of modern life, you, you know, know I'm, I'm gonna, gonna be like him. It's starting to sound less like simple filial idolization and more like foreshadowing for the Lovecraftian horrors that, that are to come. come. Let's gird our loins as we step out of the chorus wormhole yet again to be greeted by a now 18 to 20 something year old son paying a visit to his aging father. Well, he came from college just the other day. So much like a man I just had to say. Son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit a while? He shook his head and he said with a smile, what I'd really like, Dad, is to borrow the car keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? And the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon Little boy blue and the man in the moon When you're coming home, son, I don't know when But we'll get together then, Dad You know we'll have a good time With our willing suspension of disbelief allowing us to overlook why a college student needs to coax the car keys from his father with the ingratiating smile of a 16-year-old with a provisional driver's license, and the fact that the son says, see you later, before he actually has the car keys, the casual pleasure reader will be thrilled to know that we've at last reached the, oh snap, he got what was coming to him, part of the narrative. But what the casual reader might not have noticed is that the smile that never dimmed in verse 2 flashes its pearly whites here as well. This, our careful discourse sensitive reader remarks, is called motif, and it's important to note how the surrounding context imbues, like any good orthodontist, that smile with new power. No longer the power to endure neglect, but to inflict it. That the son harvests his father's car keys as if looting them off dear old dad's corpse makes it obvious that the tables have turned. But the smile just adds that extra touch of symbolism that evokes a feeling not unlike being able to throw his exact words back in your ex-boyfriend's smug, stupid little face. Aristotle actually gives us a fancy term for referring to that point in lots of good suspenseful tales when one or more characters reaps what they've been sowing, a term that translates to reversal. It's that also satisfying moment in which the destroyer is destroyed, the rapist raped, the sadistic surgeon taken apart by his own instruments. And what we find here is a comparatively quiet, but no less textbook example of reversal. The neglector is neglected by the very person he's been neglecting. The reversal often, but does not necessarily, constitute the climax of the narrative, but I would argue that it certainly does here, since since this is about as tense as things are going to get with this particular story. Our time machine chorus rattles to life yet again, albeit with one appropriate change. The father is now asking the son when he's coming home. The song's verbal motif, a miniature reenactment of the narrative's larger reversal. There remain some nice moments after the climax, gentlemen, so let's see what the final verse and chorus has in store. I've long since retired, my son's moved away I caught him up just the other day I said I'd like to see you if you don't mind He said I'd love to, Dad, if I could find the time You see, the new job's a hassle and the kids have the flu But it's sure nice talking to you, Dad It's been nice talking to you And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me He'd grown up 
just like me My boy was just like me And the cats in the cradle and the silver spoon Little boy blue and the man in the moon When you're coming home, son, I don't know when But we'll get together then, Dad You know we'll have a good time The song's final verse and chorus in the story's denouement is really just the juncture at which the knowledge of our thick skulled narrator has caught up with our own, that the son was just like the father, that dad's been modeling parental neglect like a nudist sporting the world's most flamboyant band-aid, was for us the revelation of the previous verse, though in Aristotelian terms, the revelation of the story is here. Oops, terribly sorry. Here. Better late than never, I suppose. The Greeks realized ages ago that there was a peculiar pleasure to be derived from the tension of dramatic irony, from knowing more than the characters know. And it's a gratifying, if unsubtle, moment here, if only because the song's verbal motif, one that it's been stuffing with the gunpowder of recontextualization over the course of the narrative, explodes with all the promised fanfare of bombs bursting in air. Before addressing the larger implications on narrative as a general human phenomenon, let me address a point that I've been holding off on until this guy left. I've touched on the fact that this whole when you coming home motif is one that is recontextualized repeatedly in the song, as are the nods to childhood, which is typical of language contained in the chorus of any song. But what relevance do these references and allusions bear on the narrative after verse 2, since it's hard to imagine even a ten-year-old casting a fleeting thought toward the nursery rhymes and silver spoons of his blanket-clutching days? Let's briefly break out the old Coke bottle close readers and have a crack at it, shall we? Let's start with the nursery rhymes, since they are the easiest to make sense of and since I want to save all the profound-sounding stuff for the end of the paragraph. The nursery rhymes alluded to in the song are also nonsense verse, so we could surmise that the narrator is no longer invoking a bedtime routine, but assigning language to an increasingly nonsensical life, like the rantings of a madman written on an asylum wall. The silver spoon also takes on a particularly rich symbolic dimension when we tap into its wealth connotation. The father was able to give the son all the advantages of the silver spoon, and look where that's gotten him. Finally, the cat's cradle, or in airy academic terms, the imposition of a complex pattern on something that, at day end is nothing more than string, can function as an elegant metaphor for storytelling itself, the imposition of shape and significance on events that without the tender, loving, Bob Ross-like brushstrokes of human design signify exactly nothing. So now that the song is over, the narrative accounted for, and our gun-toting casual reader dealt with, we turn now to the questions posed at the beginning of the video. What elements are required to turn a simple string of events into something we would recognize as a story? While Cats in the Cradle serves up a fully loaded baked potato of a narrative, all story elements need not show up to the table before the bovine banality of ordinary events can become the succulent steak of a good story. Still, some combination of the old elements is needed to send the signal that that glossy plastic-looking fruit is in fact edible. And no matter how painstakingly you select your ingredients, there's always going to be some pesky great aunt to complain about the garnishes or some bratty third cousin who would just as soon eat a microwaved Hot Pocket. The story elements offer a sort of spice rack with which to flavor the day-in, day-out porridge of our lives, but we certainly don't have to empty the pantry into the pot to deliver on the promise of a captivating story. On the other hand, there's only so much you can omit before you're licking salt off the table. And you postmodern types are free even to leave out tension, if you're prepared for the consequences. More interesting to me is why we tell stories to begin with. Why do we seem to crave stories as both tellers and listeners? This is a question whose answer requires a context, and in the particular case of Cats in the Cradle's somber tale, the answer to number two just so happens to be the answer to number three, our paradoxical need to reenact through narrative unpleasant, tragic, or horrifying events. While it would be quite the overstatement to claim that the events of the song are horrifying, we can label them tragic without the fear of raising too many Vulcan eyebrows. Put back in terms of the story, why does the father convey a series of events that are clearly painful to recall? 
Those highfalutin ancient Greeks come to our rescue yet again with the term catharsis, the notion that storytelling acts as a sort of release valve for those less savory emotions and desires. Yet we find something much more sophisticated than mere release in Cats in the Cradle. Remember way back in verse 1 when I, or rather my surrogate careful reader, remarked how the narrator was manipulating the flow of time? Well, that turns out to be much more important than it originally seemed because that, ladies and gentlemen, is the tragic tale's greatest power. The whole narrative as a means of mastering the ravages of time theory plays out to some extent in just about every story ever told, but it's doubly applicable in this song since, in a way, Big Papa Narrator's greatest nemesis is the time he has squandered. For him, nothing could make more sense than to engage in an activity that affords him symbolic sway over the sands in the hourglass. And for us, the human race, narrative's power extends yet further. Emperor Reality and his favorite twin enforcers, Circumstance and Consequence, are the scourge of this life. They inflict upon us wounds when we don't deserve it and scars when we do. And when we dare take more joy in life than his Imperial Highness has deigned to give us, we are too often met with the serrated kiss of his favorite assassin, Tragedy. And it is only through narrative that the taskmasters of Circumstance, Consequence, and Tragedy become our playthings. Our stories are governed by our rules, and it's within their walls that life's pet saboteurs can hurt us only to the extent that we let them. Whether we as storytellers dispose of life's scattered little dung piles directly or choose to do so vicariously as consumers, the thrill of narrative's strangely empowering glow remains, though perhaps to varying degrees of intensity. The kind of story found in Cats in the Cradle is a form of self-punishment to be sure, but Big Papa punishes purposefully and instructively, allowing himself and us at least the solace of a lesson learned. Lessons learned are often small comfort when laid against the larger ruins of this life, but take, take what, what I, I give you, you, you spoiled, spoiled little brat. brat. That is all I have to say, but certainly not all that can be said about the wonders of narrative. What have I oversimplified, overcomplicated, or left out altogether? What other story songs offer insights into narrative as a general human phenomenon? Be sure to let me know in the comments below, oh, and please be oh, sure to oh, like, oh, share, oh, and subscribe oh, for more oh, in-depth oh, song oh, analysis. This is Professor Chase. Hope to see you next lesson.